In this lecture on scalar line integrals, we're going to look at properties, and then we'll do one application. We haven't discussed yet when we would expect to be able to compute a scalar line integral. So our first theorem is that if f is continuous on its domain, then its line integral over any smooth curve in its domain does exist. So if I'm able to come up with a smooth parametrization for a curve in the domain, then we expect to be able to compute the line integral of f over that curve. Or rather, I should say, the line integral does exist. Whether or not you can actually do an integral by hand is a different question. So of course, not every integral can be integrated by hand. Here, our next theorem is, suppose I have a curve, and I parametrize it one way, and you parametrize it a different way. So suppose r1 of t and r2 of t both parametrize the same curve c. We would compute the same value for the line integral of f over c. So all right, we would get the same thing, whether we use the r1 description or the r2 description. And that shouldn't surprise you, because if we're computing, say, that curtain area, that's just a geometric quantity that we can visualize. It should be independent of parametrization. I didn't even specify that we parametrize this curve going in the same direction. And that's because it actually doesn't even matter. So suppose you and I describe the same curve, but my description travels one way along the curve and your description goes the other way. It actually doesn't matter. I think this is surprising when you first see it. But it doesn't even matter whether you go, say, forwards or backwards along the curve. You're going to get the same line integral. So to test this, you could take a function and compute its line integral over, say, the unit circle going clockwise versus counterclockwise, and you should get the same result. To talk a little bit more about the types of curves that we can integrate over, it's OK if we have a curve that perhaps would be better thought of as two curves kind of added together like this. So overall, we could view this as one curve, but it's made up out of two pieces. So we can write c equals c1 plus c2, where the addition symbol here really just means that we're taking these two curves together. In this course, when we compute line integrals, we restrict our attention to what we consider piecewise smooth simple curves. So piecewise smooth is straightforward. That just means that it's made out of nice pieces, even if the overall shape is not just one nice description. So for example, on this curve, the curve itself is not particularly nice, but it's made out of three smooth pieces. And then a simple curve is one that doesn't have self-intersections unless it's perhaps to close up. So the ending point might come back around and meet the beginning point. So while it's okay if our curve, say, comes back around and closes up, like for example, one pass around the unit circle, we don't want to have a curve that looks say, like a figure eight. How do we integrate over a piecewise smooth curve that's made up of, say, two nice pieces? Well, we can just do f over c1 plus f over c2. So if necessary, you can break a curve up into pieces like this, although typically most of our curves will have one nice description. We've already seen one application of scalar line integrals, and that was to compute curtain area. Another one is to compute mass of a wire. So in the past, we said that if you're looking at the mass of a plane lamina, the idea is density times area. The mass of some three-dimensional object in XYZ space was density times volume. For a wire, the idea is density times arc length. So that leads to the integral of the density function with respect to arc length over c, where c is a curve representing the wire. So let's compute the mass of a thin wire lying along the curve r of t equals cosine t sine t 1, for t values going from 0 to pi, with mass density function sigma of x, y, and z is x squared plus y kilograms per meter. This is a scalar line integral, so we're just going to set up the same four steps as before. The first one is to identify our parametrization, which we already have r of t equals cosine t sine t 1 for t values going from 0 to pi. Next, let's evaluate our density function along this curve. So we do the composition sigma of r. 
So that's going to be the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate, so cosine squared plus sine. Next, we compute the speed of the parametrization. So that's the length of the velocity vector, negative sine of t, cosine of t, zero. The length of that is one. In fact, this is a unit speed parametrization. Now we have all the pieces we need to set up the integral. So the mass of this wire is the integral from zero to pi, sigma of r of t, so cosine squared t plus sine t, times the speed, which in this case is just one, dt. To integrate cosine squared, I'm gonna use the power reducing formula. So we can write this as the integral from zero to pi of one plus cosine two t divided by two. And then I think I'll go ahead and anti-differentiate the second term. So let's write dt and then the antiderivative of the second term would be minus cosine of t evaluated at pi, subtract off evaluating at zero. Okay, so now we can keep going. The antiderivative of one half would be t over two, then plus sine two t over four. That's gonna get evaluated at the bounds. And then let me go ahead and evaluate the second part. That's gonna be minus, and then the quantity negative one minus one. Okay, the sine terms are gonna be zero, so that's gonna get pi over two plus two. Let's just take a quick look at the formula for the moments and the center of mass. They're exactly what you would expect. So the moment m sub yz measures how density is situated in the x direction. Then we have the y direction and the z direction. To compute the center of mass, which might not actually lie on the wire itself, it could be kind of in space and the wires bending around it, you would do x bar y bar z bar equals the moments divided by the total mass. I want to mention here that when you set up these moment calculations, you need to treat, say, x times sigma as the entire function f. So if we return back to this example, x times sigma, you would need to evaluate x sigma on r of t. So it would be cosine squared t plus sine t times the x coordinate of r of t, cosine t. To write that out, if r of t is cosine t sine t one, and sigma of x, y, and z is x squared plus y, then x sigma needs to be x sigma composed with r, which means you need to do the x coordinate of r, so cosine of t, times sigma of r, so cosine squared plus sine. Okay, I'll leave our discussion there. Thank you for your attention.